Welcome to our second presentation uh, regarding the orientation for the paralegal program at Collin College. So I'm going to take you to the module that we have devoted to the orientation materials. You'll see it's between the chapter four module and the chapter five module. Uh, we covered the PowerPoint already. I'm going to just uh, show you some other resources that we have on this website. The next are the goals of the program. And you can see here, we have several goals. Um, we want to have a diverse student body and that's not, uh, that's kind of diverse in every sense. Um, we wanna have men and women, different people of different ethnicities and races, different ages, different life experiences. Uh, we also want to cater and to meet the needs of people who are planning on becoming paralegals people who have an interest in paralegals, but the paralegal topic, but perhaps don't plan on actually having a job with that particular title. Perhaps they might want to become an HR professional or a parole officer or something like that. And then of course we have students in the program who are planning to go to law school. So we really have uh, a diverse program that we hope to appeal to a diverse group of folks who um, are interested in advancing their education. Obviously, we want to cover legal knowledge. That's really important, but there's also technology implications. If you leave our program with a good grasp of the law, but don't have any idea how to use Word, you're going to find it hard to be employable as paralegal. And so we try to balance some of those issues. Um, we don't require Word courses because many of our students come to the program with those skills already in hand. If you happen to be someone who doesn't come to the program with Microsoft Word skills, I would encourage you to develop those. You can do it formally through a course here at Collin or elsewhere, or you can do it informally through buying a book or taking a book out of the library and using those tools. It is important. You don't have to become an expert, but you do need to be able to do more than open a document and save it. We want also for students to have an understanding of the ethics of the legal profession. We are a profession and the term profession means that we are required to behave in an ethical way. And when we say ethics in the legal field, we're not just saying do the right thing, be a moral person, be a good person. Obviously that hopefully goes without saying, but um, we are also saying that we're going to follow certain laws or certain rules, even though sometimes we may disagree with them or they may be disadvantageous to us. There may even be times that we think, gosh, I think that the kinder course of action, the nicer thing to do would be something different. So sometimes the ethical rules do put a hard and a high burden on us beyond just our general sense that we ought to be good human beings. And it's important to know what we can and cannot do. We also focus a lot on written communication. We focus a lot on grammar and punctuation and writing style. We try to keep that as part of the curriculum throughout the program, certainly in our introduction to the law course, in our introduction to legal conventions, in our advanced legal documents prep, and in our legal writing course. Those are the places where we spend more time than in other courses, but hopefully in most of our other courses, we touch upon legal writing. The challenge with legal writing is that it's a skill that is really difficult to develop. Um, I can speak for myself and say that I try to improve my legal writing all the time. I am not perfect. I am learning and growing professionally all the time. And I feel that that is probably the best approach or best mindset to have when you're working in this area. And it really kind of involves two aspects. One is accepting where you are. I've got these opportunities, but I'm still going to go ahead and perform and do the best I can. But set some goals. Maybe they're weekly goals. Maybe they're monthly goals of I'm really going to master the comma this week. I'm really going to learn how to avoid passive voice this week. Whatever your goals are, if you always have something on your to-do list and you work towards it in a conscientious way, the differences will be dramatic. My experience is when students begin this program, they really aren't ready for the writing rigor of being a paralegal or an attorney. There are a few exceptions, but I would say 90% of us are um, working towards that goal. And the coursework that we have is designed to get you to that finish line. 
but it's not easy. And many folks will find that it takes more of an investment than simply one semester. It's going to require that you know you focus um, again and again on these topics. You may learn it for the test, but if you don't decide to change those practices and really implement them into your day-to-day -day lives, you may uh, find that they don't stick. One thing I suggest is that you start writing this way all the time, even in casual emails. So because the problem is that if you say, well, I won't use passive voice when I'm writing in the paralegal courses, but I'll use passive voice elsewhere. You're not going to develop that habit of avoiding passive voice. Or if you say, well, I'm going to worry about commas when I'm taking the paralegal course, but when I'm, you know, sending an email to my family members and I, I don't, I'm not going to worry about commas. Well, again, it's developing that mentality, that, that framework of thinking about commas so it transfers from short-term memory to everyday practice to long-term memory. So I would encourage you to take those changes. I can't be there with you, would want to be there with you 24-7, you wouldn't want me to be there with you 24-7. But that's the type of commitment many times it's going to take to make those changes. I have seen students who've come in being maybe a typical writer, maybe even less than average in terms of writing skills, really grow and improve. I've also seen many students who really haven't moved the bar at all. And they learn a particular rule for a test, and, but then the next semester when I see them, they're back to doing it the way they were doing it before. That's most. Don't be the most. Be the unusual. Be the exceptional. Uh, be the person who's looking to make her career or his career um, everything that it can be. And writing is the secret to it. Um, having this credential is useful, the credential from Colin. But um, at the end of the day, it's going to be what you can do day in and day out in your work. And our employers tell us all the time, very consistently, that the greatest weakness of paralegal students completing our program is in the writing. And so if you can develop these skills, you really have an opportunity to set yourself apart, get those high paying jobs, have that level of job security, get the interesting and important work. Um, and then also the commitment to pro bono and public interest activities. We have lots of opportunities in this area. Uh, this is kind of a weird year, um, so it's a little harder to volunteer than it might at other times be. Um, uh, but uh, certainly in future semesters, reach out to me or Professor Wagoner, and we'll be glad to put you in contact with individuals who can uh, give you those opportunities. I'm going to take you to a website right now, though, that can kind of introduce you to some of that. Um, the uh, legal aid organization that we have close to us is the Legal Aid of Northwest Texas. They have an office in Dallas and also McKinney and um, here is their Dallas, I guess this is, yeah, this is the McKinney office. Here, let me This is their main website, and this um, will give you opportunities for how you can uh, volunteer. Um, again, perhaps not at this time, but at a later time. There are lots of other places to volunteer. You may uh, be aware of opportunities in your community or organizations, your synagogue, your place of worship, your church. Um, the, Amer uh, the uh, uh, Dallas Bar Association, the Collin County Bar Association. Um, but again, this is probably in our area one of the most significant places to uh, spend some time. Right now, um, in the uh, COVID-19 days, I am volunteering by helping healthcare professionals who need wills. And so that's been a project that I've been able to work on remotely. Um, and so, uh, there are opportunities kind of in every season of a person's legal career. I'm going to go back to um, our main place. And then here is the degree plan form. Ordinarily, I distribute this in class and pick it up and hand them in for folks. This actually isn't the most late form. Let me actually put up here the most recent form. You go to Colin 
Mac.edu and type in request for degree plan. This is how you declare your major. And I think I might have covered this before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it now. But please, when you get a chance, fill this out. You can turn it into a, um, a uh, advisor or you can turn into Professor Wagoner and me and we'll be glad to handle that for you. Um, the advantage of having that in your files um, are several fold. One of the big ones is that once it is entered, it will help you know which courses you still need to take in order to complete the program. Um, and then you also need this credential to be completed before you can get your certificate or your associate's degree. So you'll have to complete it at some point. A degree won't issue or a certificate won't issue without the completion of this form, even if you, you know, satisfy all of the uh, requirements for that particular credential. So you'll need to complete it at some point. Might as well do it earlier rather than later. It might save you the heartache of accidentally taking a course you didn't need to take. Um, of course, if you change your mind at any point in the program, you're, you, you can change the uh, degree uh, plan uh, for free at, at any time. So it's not something you're making a commitment to, but it does allow the college to assist you in advancing towards that degree. We have a, a LinkedIn group at Colin um, for our paralegal students, and it is through, again, LinkedIn. This is some information about it. Um, this is where we post job leads. Um, right now, obviously, there aren't a lot of job needs. I don't know what the future holds. The job market was extremely good for paralegals until about a month ago. And um, I don't know if uh, the job market will pick up right away or if it'll be slow. But as we hear about opportunities, the place we'll post it is within the LinkedIn group. Let me show you the LinkedIn group. You just go to LinkedIn.com. By the way, you have to have an account set up to join the group, but an account is free. You don't need to pay anything to establish it. Now, LinkedIn will want your money. They will offer you premium membership or things like that. There's no need to sign up for anything along those lines. I'm already a member of the group. This is kind of my, my home base. Um, uh, so we're going to go to Collin College Paralegal Association. And here is where we list job opportunities. You'll see the vast majority of the things that get listed on this board are job opportunities. Um, during the heyday, we were having two and three a day. Um, most of the posts are for me, but you'll see Professor Wagoner post did one. You'll see um, sometimes other students. Here's, here's one, a, for, a graduate of the program who oftentimes hires our students, posts um, one. You'll send, here's another student who posted one, a grad, complete graduate of the program. Um, so it's a good place to hang out, and this is a, a current student in the program. So you'll see just lots of different uh, points of interest and opportunities. We try to focus on um, job leads, but we, I mean, that's our main posting, but we also do post, uh, interesting articles about you know entering uh, law school for example or about uh, job, career development things along those lines so you may be thinking how do I join well first of all you have to set up your account um, and so I'll just go to my account here um, wait a second. you can see you can um, add and change things that once you establish it and then you will um, you type here, Colin College Paralegal Association. Now, when I click on this, it's going to take me into the group because I'm already a member of the group. But um, if I weren't a member, if I would click on this, it would say, you're not a member. Do you want to join? And then you'll be given the option to request membership. I'm the administrator of the group. So I'm the person who welcomes new members. So I'm going to hit the manage group button and I'm going to go into requested and there aren't any current members who are uh, or any current people who want to become members. Um, sometimes students find it difficult to find the right buttons uh, 
uh, can, uh, excuse me, LinkedIn is always changing how they configure it and sometimes it is difficult to figure it out. So if you're having difficulty finding our group or joining our group, send me an email. What I can do is I can link with you once you've established your account and then I can invite you to join the group. After you remember the group, you can unlink with me if you want or you can say linked. I can't invite you though if we aren't linked. And so um, just let me know if there's any difficulties because we definitely do want you to join so you can get advantage of the job board and all the other member uh, benefits of the membership. And you will remain a member throughout your career. You don't ever have to leave. It's not just for current students, but also for former students. You'll see below this document, there is an op extra credit opportunity. When you join our group, you get five points of extra credit um, added to your final examination grade. So it's super easy. Literally what you do after you've joined the group um, and you're a member of the group, then you cut and paste this, copy, you hit submit, you put it right here, and then you put your name. I do this because sometimes people don't use their um, typical name, maybe, um, well, for example, my name is Cynthia Ferris Groover. Maybe I wanted to be professionally known as Cynthia Ferris. Um, I wanted to go by my maiden name um, or whatever. So that, again, that, that can be whatever you might want to use. And so you put that name in. This allows me to search quickly to make sure, yes, this person is, has, is being truthful and they have actually joined this group. And the other thing that I'm saying is that my current employment status is updated. So if you've joined LinkedIn in a previous semester, just go in and make sure that your current employment information is up to speed. And we ask that you do maintain that going forward. Um, we like to know the successes of our students, what they're doing professionally. This is one of the main ways we're able to uh, see the successes that you're able to accomplish. Then you just hit submit and it's a done deal. So I just earned myself five extra points on the final examination. Again, you have to be a member before you do that, but it's a pretty quick process to do that. And if you uh, apply for membership and I don't uh, wave you through in, the, in a day or two, send me an email because um, membership requests kind of come in droves. I'll get a lot uh, at the beginning of the semester and I won't get any in the middle part and so I'll forget to look. So I, I don't mean to leave you hanging. Um, here are some interesting articles uh, that you might find uh, kind of well interesting about how, how paralegals are billed and, and things like this. Here's some information about law school I like to share. And then here are some catalog entries. You'll see they're a little bit dated, so I'm actually going to go to the current catalog information. So I'm going to go to Colin.edu and I'm going to go to academics. I'm going to go here to degrees and areas of study. I'm going to scroll down. Our program is a workforce program. And then I'm going to go to law, public policy, corrections, and security. Ours is the bottom choice. And then this is our catalog entry here. You can see, I'll show you our website first. You can see our website here. This gives you some information about our program. It's more directed towards students who are considering the program than current students in the program. So it's more of an advertising thing than anything else. I'd say our LinkedIn group is more for current uh, students in our program and graduates. Then we have our AAS program and our certificate program. I'm going to cover the AAS first and then I'll do the certificate. One of the questions that I commonly get is, well, I'm a student in the program, which program is right for me? It's pretty easy to sort and to know which one is best fit for you. If you already have a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree in any discipline, then the right credential for you is a certificate. If you don't have an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, the right credential for you is the AAS. It is true though that if you get the certificate, it's quite possible that you will satisfy all of the requirements of the AAS. And so you might find, well, I can automatically qualify for the AAS 
even though I'm a certificate student, should I get the second credential? It doesn't cost you any more, so you might as well. It's not going to harm you, but it's not going to necessarily be much help to you in your career. So that's the main thing is where you are in terms of your education before you entered this program. So I'm going to go through the AES first because that's where most of our students are. So these are the courses. Um, really the ordering of courses is not important. Lots of times students say, well, but that course isn't being offered this semester. No worries. We have relatively few prerequisites in the program. We do that because we're not able to offer every course every semester and we don't want to delay our students from completing. And so instructors know in the first couple of weeks many times we have to uh, set the, the foundation for the course for and we have to understand that there may be people in the in the program or in the particular course we're, we're offering that this is their first semester in the program uh, once you've been in the program a, a semester or two you might start feeling like oh my gosh here we're getting this introduction yet again uh, we apologize for for that but it is necessary so that our new students are feeling acclimated and feeling like they're a part. So you'll see the courses that are underlined, like the English course here, and the math course, and the government course, and the philosophy course, and the gen ed speech course. These are what we call general education courses, or sometimes they're called the core. These are designed to provide you with a broad background of, of knowledge and experience um, and academic preparation for your life after school. This is, these are the courses are the main difference between our associate's degree and our certificate. The certificate doesn't have these additional courses. And the reason why it doesn't is it's, if you've already have your associate's degree or your bachelor's degree, you already took freshman English, you already took math, you already took a government course. And so uh, there isn't the need to necessarily um, expose you to that stuff again, unless you're interested in taking it. So um, I think every student in at Collin, whether they are an associate student or a certificate student, unless it's one of those very, very short certificates, takes English composition, English 1301. It is the most common course. We also have English 1302, which is kind of the second semester of that course. Um, and again, you uh, don't have to take the, you know, you can take these in other semesters. You don't have to take this the first semester or this um, in a particular summer semester or anything like that. Take them when they make sense for you. And then we have um, our math requirement. You can see that the math requirement has a little uh, footnote here. And you can see that there are several courses that can be substituted. Some people love math and uh, having strong math skills can make you a very, very valuable paralegal. But I would say the typical paralegal student, and there's many exceptions to this, but, or I'll say the typical, but many paralegal students do not enjoy math. Um, some individuals are even a little intimidated by it. If that's your situation and, and the word algebra is is not your your thing you don't really want to take a course called algebra we offer other options uh, you're welcome to come talk to me I'll, I'll give you more details about about that but any of these courses will satisfy the requirement you don't have to take college algebra if that's not your happy spot if you decide you do want to take algebra but you decide you know what i need a little bit more support than the traditional student then you might want to consider math 1414 you can see the second digit in the number, the one that's a three. What that means in our numbering system is it means that the course is three hours, meaning there are three hours of instruction every week. This course covers exactly the same material, but it's actually four hours a week. So you get a little bit more hand-holding, a little bit more support from the instructor in this course. So it's the same in terms of content. There's just a little bit more support for you. And again, there are other courses here that may make uh, sense for folks who uh, don't enjoy math as much. Obviously, if math is your thing, or, or perhaps you have a higher level math already, then um, you uh, may want to talk to the advisors about, let's say you're taking calculus, for example. That can easily sub in for uh, an algebra or another course. Um, 
government is a federal government course. This will be a piece of cake once you've taken paralegal courses for very long. You might want to start with this one because it may remind you of some of the stuff that you're learning in the paralegal courses. This course will generally be quite a bit easier than what you'll experience in a paralegal course, but it's a good refresher and introduction to it. Philosophy, you don't have to take philosophy. This is kind of similar to the math. You've got lots of options. Um, actually, we're saying this is recommended for students taking the LSAT. Um, for those of y'all that are thinking about law school, you'll probably be taking the, the LSAT. The LSAT is an interesting test. Um, it requires no legal knowledge at all. Really what the questions are, are kind of like uh, logic puzzles. Let me kind of give you an example of how these logic puzzles, you may have, have seen them before. Um, Mary is three years older than her brother Ted. Ted has red hair and there and his twin Harold is left-handed. You know, when is when is Mary's birthday or you know whatever the question is. It's one of those things where you're given lots of pieces of data um, and you have to figure out some conclusion from it. And you'll see that on the t on the uh, LSAT test the questions don't even relate to a legal context. And that the idea behind those is that there's a particular way of thinking that is quote unquote thinking like a lawyer. Um, it's not the only way of thinking and I hesitate to say it's the logical way of thinking because that suggests other ways of thinking are illogical and that's not at all the case. But it's a particular logic that you apply in the legal area. And uh, the foundation of that style of thinking is in a formal logic course. And the, or, the course that we offer at Colin that is a formal logic course is Introduction to Logic. Um, I took a course similar to this, obviously not at Colin because I wasn't here, <laughs> but um, I took a course that was similar to this in the philosophy department in my college um, before I took the LSAT. And I'm very, very glad that I had done it. It really uh, is very helpful, not only in LSAT prep, certainly helps with that, but it also helps in law school work and just generally in the practice of law. Having said that, paralegals don't need to take this particular course. Um, it's not required even for attorneys, although it's a, a very good uh, idea. Um, so if you've already taken a humanities or fine art option and you don't want to take another one, you absolutely don't have to take this course. If you're not thinking about law school and my description doesn't interest you, you don't have to take this course at all. If you're interested in getting more information about what a formal logic course is like, you can check out a book from the bookstore, I mean from the library, or you can uh, come to my office. I've got my, my, my textbook from, from college in my office. Obviously you can't do that now, but when the, when the uh, situation is better, I'll be glad to show you what a formal logic book is like. It's um, an interesting science uh, that I, I found very compelling, and you may or may not agree with me at the end of it. Then you need to take a speech course. Um, there's lots of different speech courses available. You can choose the one that makes most sense for you. So those are the general education courses. If you're transferring from another school, you've done some of your associate's degree somewhere else, um, you may well find that some of these courses transfer, especially if you took them within the state of Texas. Okay, so now I'm gonna focus on the legal courses. Let me first of all go back I'm going to go back to course. Oh, actually, I've got. I'm going to go to course descriptions, and I'm going to go to our rubric, which is LGLA, and click on paralegal, and you can see the course description for all of the courses in our program. The only one that we wrote here at Colin is this one. This is our only what's called local needs course. The rest of these descriptions are um, uh, from a, a book called The Wacom, which is um, a book that is uh, produced by the state of Texas um, that for all workforce type programs. So you can see a brief description of what we do in the various courses. So if you're curious or you look at the name, of course you're like, oh, I'm not sure what's going on there. This can be a good resource. So I'm going to return to our list of courses. Legal research, many of y'all are already taking this course. 
it's a good one to take your first semester, but by no means is it one you have to take your first semester. Um, I, in the spring, we usually offer this during the day on the Frisco campus. In the fall and the spring, it is also offered on the Plano campus, um, typically at night, Professor Wagoner teaches it. So this is where we really get that opportunity to learn about Westlaw. You have access to Westlaw throughout the program, but it, it's nice to have somebody kind of show you the ropes, kind of speaking. And this is the course where you really get to see the ropes. And so once you kind of get introduced to the ropes, we, we hope that what's going to happen is you're going to continue to play around with it throughout your time in the program. And then when you complete and go out and, and work professionally as a paralegal, you will have a significant amount of experience. That's our goal. That's what we want to have happen. What we don't want to have happen is you do an assignment or two when you're in legal research and then never use your, your uh, password again. Um, it's not that helpful to just have done it once or twice in, in the year and a half that you're in the program. We encourage you to use it on a regular basis. It's really cool and it's a it's a resource that uh, for legal professionals costs probably about 200 or, or more dollars a month to maintain. So you're getting a pretty uh, expensive a tool and certainly in this time where you're not able to go to the law library and you're not able to meet as easily with with colleagues um, spending some time on Westlaw is probably a good investment if you've mislaid your password or something like that reach out to me and I'll be glad to help you out with that so legal research a lot of it is online re research we also though uh, try to not just help you find resources but help you know what to do with the resource once you find it you know it's one thing to find a case ah this case is relevant to my research but if you don't know how to read a case it doesn't do a lot of good to find it right or if you don't know how to read a statute it doesn't do a lot of good to have found it but not be able to make sense of it and so that's a big part of the legal research case the legal legal research course as well you've already taken intro so we won't talk more about that so the takeaway from here is if you haven't taken legal research yet, I would encourage you to sign up for it in the fall with Professor Wagner. It's a course that fills up pretty, pretty quickly, so I hope that you'll get that opportunity to fill sooner rather than later. We offer on the Frisco campus, but it's probably better to take it in the Plano campus because that's where our law library is. And so what Professor Wagner will use is he will have times where we actually go down to the stacks and, and go through the law library resources so you can have the online experience as well as the paper book experience. Let's go to our next semester. We have civil litigation here. This is a course taught typically by Professor Towns, although this semester is being taught by Professor Hawkins. They're both awesome instructors who um, are part-time instructors in our program, and they practice as litigating attorneys on a regular basis. They are experts in the Texas court system and also the federal court system. And so they will give you practical guidance about um, what the documents look like, how to prepare the documents, how to have that experience with documents. Um, uh, about half of all um, attorneys are directly involved in litigation as kind of the primary part of their job. And I would say that probably at least that high a percentage of paralegals are. So this course can be extremely helpful, but I would say there's virtually no paralegal who has no involvement with the court system, or at least I would say less than 10% have no involvement with the court system. And so knowing uh, what that process is like, what the documents look like, how to prepare those documents is an important part of your preparation as a paralegal. I would also encourage you to take this course early on in the program, especially if you're looking for employability, um, because you're very likely to be employed initially, say, in a family law practice or in a general commercial litigation practice. And of course, knowing about litigation would be very relevant to those types of practices. Torts is our first online course here. We encourage students to uh, save up online courses to some extent, um, because um, Online courses fill up quickly, and so if you save them for a particular semester, they, you may find, oh, those courses aren't f are already filled by the time I'm ready to take them. Um, 
they're also good for the summer because over the summer we don't offer a lot of face-to-face -face courses. Uh, that's because we have some students who choose to take the summer off completely and we have other students who have travel plans or other things and so they're not available for face-to-face -face classes. So I encourage you to save up your online courses for summers and to take them uh, when you're able to get into a particular course and don't plan on taking say three in a semester because you at the end of the program let's say because you may find that there just aren't spaces in it and, and we're not allowed to overfill our online courses contracts is another online uh, professor wagner teaches the, this torts course i will tell you that if you're thinking about law school this is the course that is probably most like law school in our program this is a staple of the first year of law school uh, there are fundamental differences between how law school works and how paralegal programs work for sure but in terms of the content i would say that we probably cover uh, maybe 30 percent of the material that you would cover in a law school course so it's a really good preparation you'll find that most of the people in law school will have no previous legal experience so you coming in as a paralegal who's taken a torts course you will be very well prepared. You'll know the terminology, you'll know the concepts, you'll have a, a mental framework to organize the information that you're receiving. And so you will have a tremendous advantage over the other students. And you probably already know this, but if you don't, law school is all about class rank. So um, having a leg up on your competition is not a bad thing in law school. Another very common course, I would say probably virtually every law school has contracts in their first, first year. <coughs> Typically in law school, courses are year-long courses, not semester-long courses. And so this is another good introduction to how contracts uh, work. And uh, it covers much of the same material that we cover in, or that would be covered in a law school course. Um, this is offered online, and so you can take this when you will. I teach this one. Our next one is also an online course. This is business organizations. It's um, about how to establish and maintain various business structures, corporations, partnerships, limited liability companies, limited liability partnerships, those types of entities require certain uh, paperwork to be filed with the state um, and also certain paperwork to maintain that filing. So this is a course about how to do those particular actions. It's also offered online. And that's why we have these two courses in the summer, because they are courses that are offered on an online basis. Um, and that's, we, we almost always offer these courses in the summertime. Let's now go to um, the uh, next semester, the legal writing. Legal writing is our most demanding course by far. Um, I would say it's at least as demanding as two of our other courses. So I'm disappointed that the way they've set this up is with five courses. It, it's difficult to, to set things up so it balances out. Um, but, but I would work with the assumption of uh, assume that this counts as two courses. Um, it is only offered on a face-to-face -face basis. I teach it on the Frisco campus um, in the fall and Professor Wagoner teaches it on the Plano campus in the evening in the spring. This fall, fall 2020, Professor Wagner will also be teaching it on our campus during the day. Um, it's a, a response to um, uh, some other issues, which we'll talk about later, that we're doing a bit of a different schedule there. Um, Professor Wagner is an English major, so he's very, very uh, familiar with, with all the kinds of legal writing concerns. So you'll be in very good hands if he is, in your, he is your instructor for that course. Um, but just be prepared to work a lot harder in that course than our other courses. Um, the next course is family law. The, our usual family law instructor is a full-time family law instructor. She actually works for Legal Aid of Northwest Texas. Um, most of the work that Legal Aid of Northwest Texas does is in the family law area, supporting people of um, a low economic means who need some assistance with family law concerns although there are some other topics that they handle such as landlord tenant issues and things like that so professor morgan is an expert in family law um, i have taught that course um, and um, 
I am not the right person to teach that course. I will be candid with you. The reason for that is several. I mean, obviously, I've never practiced in that area. Family law is different than many of our other disciplines in that the judge in a family law courtroom has a great deal of discretion. Yes, we have a statute, and yes, that statute must be complied with. But most of the provisions of that statute provide that the, the judge has a great deal of discretion about he how he or she decides to, to handle cases. And that's because the judge actually gets to hear testimony and, and have an impression about who ought to get certain assets or who would be the better custodial parent, those types of things. And so it's important in this area, probably more than any other, to know what actually happens in the courts in this particular county. And so if you were to tell me, well, I plan on practicing family law in Houston, well, I would say, wait to take your family law course or take it again um, at Lone Star uh, college or at San Jacinto Community College or at Houston Community College where you will um, see that you will learn how the Harris County judges handle matters. Here you'll learn about how Collin County judges handle matters. We have lots of anecdotes, lots of uh, real world in the trenches type of things. So this is help, extremely helpful if you're planning on being in uh, Collin County or in Dallas County or in Denton County, this area. It's a very individualized kind of regional type uh, thing to be familiar with. Okay, so the next one is advanced legal documents prep. I teach this. Um, typically we offer this in the summer and then we offer it in the spring. Um, usually I offer a double section of it in the spring. Um, in my opinion, it is the easiest course in our program. But I'm going to put a caveat on that. It has a lot of assignments. So because it's an online course with lots of assignments, you really need to be somebody who's a, a detailed self-starter, self-planner. And um, you can't wait until the last day. It's not a lot of work. Probably each one of the assignments takes 30 minutes or an hour to do um, in addition to the lecture time. Uh, so it's in terms of, of and there's very little reading to do. Um, but so in terms of the work demand, it's less, but you have to stay on it and you have to watch those lectures and you have to have some familiarity with Microsoft Word. So if you don't have those things, you may want to develop a little Microsoft Word familiarity beforehand. We offer it over the summer, but because there are so many assignments, there will be weeks that you'll have maybe four or five assignments to do in a particular week. None of them are very long, but you may end up spending, you know, 10 hours just getting out all those assignments and watching all those lectures. Um, taking in the spring, you may find the workload a little bit more manageable. So it's not hard stuff, but it's a lot of stuff. And so you may want to think about the spring. Introduction to Legal Conventions is another online course. Professor Wagoner teaches this. He's the one who developed this from scratch. And this is our grammar course for the most part. It also has some blue booking aspects. We have found um, that our students are smart and hardworking and uh, interested in, in being very, very successful. And we want every student to be successful. And one of the ways that we feel like we can make st help students be successful is by really having a deep understanding of the grammar. Um, once upon a time, I'm older than almost everybody, probably everyone in the program, but once upon a time when I was in school, we diagrammed sentences and we really learned how to take apart and put together sentences, really learn the grammar. And that's something that uh, for whatever reason, our schools stop doing. I have school children in, in high school who don't know the things that uh, I would have learned in fifth or sixth grade, and they're in high school now. So it's a different educational approach on these issues. Whether it's good or, or not good for most of our students, it's definitely putting our students who want to become legal professionals at a disadvantage, because you really do need to know all of those ins and outs. Uh, you need to know uh, all those picky little grammar things. You know, if you decide to become an engineer or um, a nurse or something like that, knowing the, the exact correct way of using any or all 
or uh, how to use pronouns correctly may not be important at all. The importance may just be in communication. In the legal area, communication is obviously really important, but following those sometimes very technical rules are also important. And so Professor Wagoner is going to do some hand-holding and help you through that process. Now I'm glad to help you through it here and here, because there's a lot of grammar in advanced legal documents prep, and through here, and through here. We've got four opportunities. My suggestion is start early, because if you learn it early on, then you won't have to learn it again, and you'll get good grades throughout all these programs. When I send them to senior students who've gone through two or three of these courses and not done so well, and then they learn it. And that's great. I mean, the important thing is you learn it. So when you learn it is, is somewhat irrelevant. But the earlier you can learn it, the better your grades are going to be. And honestly, the less frustrating that the topics will be. So I would encourage, um, and in fact, if, if again, the, this, these orders of the courses don't, in my opinion, make a lot of sense, I would encourage you to take this earlier. If there are still spots in the summer program, I would encourage you to sign up for Introduction to Legal Conventions this summer. And I'm going to be honest with you, I've never taken this course with Professor Wagner, but I can guarantee if I were to take it, I would get refreshed on some grammar. I mean, none of us are above learning some grammar. Um, every time I teach legal writing, I am refreshed on certain grammar points. That's just the nature of, of the beast, that none of us can have complete recall of every little picky rule. And so being reminded of it repeatedly is um, helps us you know, keep it in that in that uh, front of mind type situation. Then we also have wills. We have a practitioner teach this course. Um, we have Professor Tolliver and Professor Parake teach this course. Professor Parake is taking this semester off. She'll be back in another, probably in the fall, to teach it. Uh, both of them are very experienced uh, 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 estate planning professionals. This course is neat in that at the end of the course, you will have a really, really good will that you will have written yourself. And so um, for the course, for the cost of tuition in the textbook, you'll have something that is every bit as good as what an attorney would have written for you for a fraction of the cost. Um, so you might even want to send other people who aren't even in the paralegal program, but who need a will. This is a good way of developing that that tool. And of course it's also a good way to learn about whether estate planning is an area of practice that is compelling for you. I think estate planning can be a really good mix for folks who don't like uh, uh, controversy or confrontation. Uh, there is some of that in every practice area, but most of the time with a wills practice you're dealing with folks who just want to get their affairs in order. Um, and get their, their documents in line, and it's usually not a confrontational practice. And then here's our course. We call this course our capstone course. This is the final course in the program. We recommend that you save it for the final semester. You don't have to, but it's a strong recommendation. What this course does is it prepares you to take the certified legal assistant exam that NALA offers. I'm just going to show you that website here. So you go to NALA.org. We've talked about NALA from time to time. It's the largest paralegal organization in the United States. It's the most prestigious. Um, this is the certification that they offer. They have uh, uh, two programs. They have the advanced, which of course you need to pass the first one. And, um, and we'll go to um, this. It's called the CP or CLA. This tells you um, how you can uh, apply to take the test. You are eligible to take it once you complete our program. And you can see there's examples of, of what's on the test, um, the various uh, fields, and they break it down by questions. And one of the things you'll see as you go through these courses is that, wow, this is basically the curriculum that we have. And you're right. We've designed our our curriculum intentionally to model these areas. Um, some of these you may not recognize the name of it because we don't necessarily call it these things. The only thing that we don't routinely offer that's here is about real estate law 
and we um, likely will be offering a real estate course in the near future. Um, there's a long history about why we don't offer a real estate course to this point. The short answer is that NALA usually hasn't required real estate knowledge for its tests. It has recently added it back and so we're in the uh, we're, we are uh, in the process of, of considering adding it back to the curriculum. So that's a little overview about that course. So you can see that as you're preparing for this test in this capstone course, you're also refreshing on all these other courses that you've taken. Um, and so if you haven't taken torch yet and you attempt this course, you're going to be at a real disadvantage because all the other people in the class will have taken torts. And the instructor here isn't going to teach you torts law. She's going to refresh you on what torts law is. And she's going to teach you strategies for being successful on the exam. So it's a best practice to take, um, you know, virtually all of this before you dive into the CP exam or the CLA exam, whichever you want to call it. The instructor of this course is our only instructor who is not a licensed attorney. She is amazing. She is a paralegal um, and she uh, actually is, is, uh, uh, has been involved in writing, not this exam, but the exam, one of the other um, uh, certified tests out there. She's very involved in the uh, ABA process for accreditation of paralegal programs and just lots and lots of really cool things. We are so incredibly lucky to have her on as one of our faculty and she's a, a an inspiration and a tremendous mentor um, to our students so we're, we're very very blessed to have her if professor Mancillo isn't your teacher though and we have a, a licensed attorney we oftentimes are able to get a licensed attorney in this course um, when professor Mancillo is not available who was a paralegal at some time in her career his career so um, this is a, a nice end of the program, kind of refreshes you on the other aspects of the program that you've already learned. You do not have to take this test. So it is a preparation for the test, but it's your decision whether you want to take the test or not. It's not an inexpensive test. Let me just go back here and go back. Um, let's see where the fees are. Uh, let's see. I don't want to make a guess as to the cost and be wrong. <laughs> Maybe it'll tell us in the FAX. Ah, here, let's look at the fees here. So it'll be $250 if you're a member of NALA, $275 if you are not. If you're a student, I guess you do perhaps get to uh, participate in the reduced uh, tuition. So that may make, give you motivation to take it earlier. If you want to take the test, I highly recommend you take it immediately after, I mean, within two or three months after you take that capstone course. No one sits for the bar except they have immediately completed a bar review course. And this really is a mini bar. Um, and so you, you can't expect to have retained all that knowledge for more than a, a two or three months at the high level you need it to be successful on the test. So you ought to plan on taking it very, very shortly after you complete the course. It is not necessary that you pass all aspects of the test the first time. While we've definitely had students who do that, probably it's more common for students to pass all the parts except for the JNA, which is the judgment and analysis section of the test. And that is the writing part. As you can imagine, the writing part is the most difficult. Uh, the same struggles that students in our program have, students everywhere have with writing, the grammar, the style, all those things. And so um, you're in good company in that sense. And you can take that a second time. And I've even had students take it a third and even a fourth time and be successful. And that's your, your choice. If you are taking just a portion of the test, you can um, take it at a reduced cost. Um, if you aren't sure whether that's the right test for you, 
I would encourage you to talk to Professor Mancillo about um, whether you're um, uh, likely to be successful with that particular test. Let me go back to our courses. Okay, we also have electives. Now you can see we've put the two electives right here at the end. Um, you, you, you probably don't want to wait until the end for your electives. Um, I'm going to talk about the electives that we offer. They're right here and give you an overview of these. Um, the first is um, employment law. This is one I teach and I will be offering it as an online course for the first time in the fall. I'm going to tell you quite honestly that the first semester you take an online course there's going to be bumps. Um, so um, just be prepared for that. If you're a person who likes smooth sailing and everything to be a well-oiled machine, it may not be that. Um, I don't expect that we will offer it again until next fall though. So if you really want to take employment law, you may want to go ahead and just dive in there and, and uh, uh, try it on the online version. Um, we might offer it next summer, I just don't know. We weren't going to offer it this fall. We kind of uh, sped things up for this course because um, one of our regular uh, faculty um, is not available to teach and so we had to make some quick movements of things around and um, COVID-19 also affected some of our scheduling things so we're offering this a semester earlier than we had planned and that on top of the fact that it is a new online course could present a few hiccups. Uh, the next course is not a course that we routinely offer, so let's move on from that. I think it will probably be removed from the curriculum this next year. Then um, this course, let's see, actually let me look at getting some of the numbers mixed up. Let me go here. This will be easier if I have the numbers in front of me. Ah, so yeah, okay, so this was the course, that's what I thought. This is the course that we no longer routinely offer, 1344. 1343 is a course we do usually offer. The instructor is not available to teach in the fall, and this is a very specialized course. Um, it um, is a federal practice, uh, so it is not in state courts, it's in federal courts. Um, it had become less popular because when times are good, a bankruptcy, fortunately, is a less common option. Uh, unfortunately, with the COVID-19 activities, I, I am concerned that we might see an uptick in the business in this area. And so um, it may be an area that there will be more interest in activity. We're not, not going to offer this course. Uh, the only reason that we're not offering in the fall is because our instructor is not available. And it is such a specialized area that we really, it, it's not helpful for students to have somebody who doesn't practice in the area to attempt to teach that course. We have a co-op program. This is really a, I mean, some students think it's the best ever. I mean, I've had some students say, this is the best thing that happened to me at Collin. I've also had other students say, why would I pay tuition dollars to go to work? <laughs> and I understand both perspectives. So if you happen to be in the second perspective, you don't have to take this. This is not a required thing at all. This is a, a, an elective option that you have. Um, once you find your place of employment, then you will work for 20 hours a week or more. Typically, it's a paid uh, internship, although uh, we've seen a couple times where people have chosen uh, to have an internship that's unpaid. And um, in addition to working the 20 hours or so a week, you will also um, uh, have the opportunity or you will be given, you will, you will work with your manager to come up with five goals during the internship. And for example, if you were doing it at a estate planning law firm, one of your goals might be to draft a will. Uh, that might be one goal. Another goal might be to uh, prove up a will, um, that process. A third might be to um, have a client meeting where you are responsible for gathering all the client information. Um, a fourth might be to set up a, a wills file within your law firm with all the different components that need to be in that. 
Um, so those are four examples of goals that you might have in a, an estate planning law firm. Um, and then you would also need to attend a, a few um, typically online, but they can be face-to-face -face lectures um, and you have to write a paper at the end. Uh, so that is one option. If you are interested in that, let me open this up. The person to speak to is John Hines. I would have invited Mr. Hines to speak to our class. To tell you more about this, but um, he's still available for you. And so this is uh, his email and his title is career coach. He can give you leads to find your internship and he will be kind of helping you through this process. Also Professor Wagoner is our um, uh, faculty person who supports. And I'm glad to help too with questions. I used to have that role um, that Professor Wagner was kind enough to assume. So um, this is something to consider. If the job market is sluggish after the, we're, we get out of quarantine, um, then this can be a good way of getting yourself into a law firm to get some legal experience. Um, you can present yourself as an intern. They're not making a long-term commitment with you. They may be willing under those circumstances to offer you a paid job or perhaps an unpaid job if, if times really are tough. And then you will get meaningful experience that you can then use to get the paying job. Less than ideal, but it can be a stepping stone to that paid job, especially if times are, are challenging. We've been blessed in the last several years with really really strong paralegal market hopefully that continues but if it doesn't this is a real possibility we have law office management law office management is usually offered in the fall this is our only paralegal course that is not uh, teaching you a particular legal topic or a particular uh, paralegal skill it is really designed to show you how the law office works. And it's especially useful if you plan to work in a small law firm, uh, perhaps with a family member and you're going to be the office manager. Um, and you uh, want to know, well, how do I select billing software? How do I negotiate that contract with a copier uh, supplier or, or things along those lines? So it's really about the behind the scenes things that happen in a law firm. In small law firms, often the paralegal is the office manager. And so this can be a good topic to learn about. We saw that real estate is a topic that is on the NALA test. And um, it is a practice area. It's kind of feast or famine. When times are good, there's lots of real, real estate deals to be made. When times aren't good, bankruptcy <laughs> becomes the, the, the hot uh, topic. Uh, this is not a course about how to become a real estate agent or anything along those lines. It's about um, the, the law of, of um, uh, how, how land can be conveyed in various uh, formats um, and things along those lines. Um, it is not a course we have routinely offered, but um, it may be one that we will be offering in the future. Criminal law. This is one of our most popular electives. I think because we have such a dynamic in, uh, instructor, Professor Nolte is a criminal attorney himself. And uh, he was an assistant district attorney in Collin County and then uh, now works um, on criminal defense work. He's been in a lot of high profile cases. He's got wonderful, highly amusing anecdotes. And he's just a very, very entertaining person uh, to hear uh, speak about this area of the law. He's got a lot of passion for it. So um, even if criminal law isn't what you hope to do, I think you're gonna, you would find this course very, very interesting. And then intellectual property. Um, this is, intellectual property is the discipline that is the highest compensated and uh, probably offers the most employment stability. Um, it is an area that we are blessed in Texas because we have a, um, not just Texas in the Dallas market, we have a patent and trademark office here. 
And so this is, we are a, nub, a, a hub for this type of, of uh, practice area. This is also a federal practice. Um, and in order to practice in there, this area, you need to be a member of the intellectual property bar. And as a result, um, uh, Professor Wagoner and I are really not qualified to teach this course. We are very fortunate to have a highly qualified IP attorney who practices in this area. Um, and we have a close relationships with a couple of law firms in the intellectual property area. If you have an interest in science, engineering, technology, this would be what I would strongly recommend you consider for your practice area. Um, so those are some um, information about uh, the, the um, electives that we offer. And let me go back to here. So I'm just going to show you the schedule that we have. Let me do that too. I'm going to show you the schedule we have for the summer and the fall. So you go to academics, you go to schedule, you schedule. I'm going to look at summer and May semester. And I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to look at LGLA. All of our courses obviously have that style. And here are the courses that we're offering. Intro to law, you're not interested in, you're already taking it. Civil litigation, we'll pause for that one a second. Contracts, introduction to legal conventions, business organizations, advanced legal documents prep. All of these are online courses. You can see right here that all but business organizations are getting fairly tight in terms of seats and they will not let over overloads. We have asked in the past that is a complete not option. So if you have an interest in jumping into one of these classes or two of these classes or three of these classes, you need to do so really, really quickly. Another course is civil litigation. Professor Hawkins is going to be teaching this. This is one of our few, actually it would be one of our few face-to-face -face courses. I think the plan is to offer all of these online. Professor Hawkins has been teaching this course online in the spring, so he will be up to speed with the technology and, and be aware of those things. So if you want to not see me and Professor Wagoner all the time, he is the one person um, that will be teaching. And by the way, um, he's a wonderful guy um, and has been so, so supportive of our, pro of our program for so many years. He's a relatively new instructor, but is a tremendous asset to our program overall. I can't tell you how many uh, students in our program he has personally helped. Very, very generous and helpful uh, professional. Of course, if you're tired of paralegals, you can always go back and take some of those um, courses uh, that are, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, bread and butter courses, the, the general education courses. Speaking of that, let's go. Oh, well, before we do that, let me, getting a little scattered here. <laughs> let's look at fall. I think fall courses might be posted. If you wait to take civil litigation, you will probably have the opportunity to take it with Professor Towns in the fall in a face-to-face -face format. Professor Towns is our regular teacher. Let's see, credit fall. And I'll be honest with you, he is very popular with our students. I would say Professor Nolte and Professor Towns are probably our most popular instructors. Um, here we go. So here we have uh, legal research. So Professor Wagoner will be teaching that during the day on the Plano campus. Legal writing, Professor Wagoner will be teaching it on this campus. This is that course I usually teach. Professor Wagoner has graciously agreed to teach it. We'll go through an introduction. You can see this is that online course that I will be teaching. Um, a civil litigation, Professor Towns will be teaching it. Um, again, a very entertaining gentleman, uh, very experienced in this area. I will be teaching contracts online. Um, Professor Parake, who is our usual Wills teacher, will, will be teaching it. 
um, as well. Uh, Family Law will have Professor Morgan teaching it. You can see the campus that the courses are on. These are both on our campus. Usually these flip back and forth. So if it's important that you take courses on the Frisco campus, you may want to sign up for these courses um, at this semester because usually they're going to flip on over to the Plano campus in the uh, spring. Introduction to Legal Conventions, that's another online course. Here's the co-op we talked about before. Torts is online. Law Office Management is taught by Professor Elkins. She's been on our faculty forever. Very, very experienced attorney. She'll be teaching it on the Plano campus. She's run her own practice. She's uh, not entirely sure what she's doing right now, but she has been a solo practitioner for a significant period of time. So she has managed her own law office for quite a while. So she has a lot of firsthand knowledge about the factors that go into that. Um, and she has a very interesting teaching style. Um, I love to go to her classes because of the specific approach she uses. She um, goes through the textbook with students and helps the student understand and get a context for the information in the textbook. Um, a very, very uh, interesting and I think very powerful learning approach. Uh, business organizations, Professor Wagner is going to teach it online. You're, you're not quite ready for the certified legal exam, but Professor Mancillo uh, will be teaching that in the fall. So that gives you an overview of the online, of the online and face-to-face -face courses. And hopefully we'll be back to face-to-face, -face, at least for some of our courses in the fall. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to the... Um, a certificate. So I've gone through the um, AAS and now I'm going to show the certificate. And you'll see the certificate is very similar to the AAS. Um, all of our courses have the LGLA. There's no English or math that's necessary if you meet these requirements. Okay, so um, the courses that are missing are you don't have to take wills and you don't have to take family law, but they are electives. So if you're somebody who wants to, who's eligible for the certificate, but who also wants the AAS but doesn't want to take any extra courses, then the electives that you ought to take are, should be wills and family law. They're smart electives anyway. Um, if you take, for example, employment law, or you take law office management, or you take intellectual property or criminal law, you will still need to take the, the um, two required courses of wills and family law that are part of the AAS. So uh, this is an overview of the requirements here. Again, course order, other than the certified, the, the capstone course, isn't so important. I would encourage you to take this course early on and this course early on and obviously take this course which you've already taken. Beyond that, um, fit, it, fit things in when they fit with your schedule. Um, you may want to save your, if you're not currently working um, in an 8 to 5 job, you may want to save some of your face-to-face -face courses for the time that you are working in a face-to-face -face job. In, in, uh, it's a little easier to manage online courses in that type of situation. So I, I encourage people generally to take the face-to-face -face earlier when they aren't already working in a, par in a paralegal position. So let me go back to our, our starting point. We've talked about, uh, we went through the PowerPoint, we talked about the paralegal goals, and um, we'll talk about this in a second. We went through the request for degree plan, we talked about the LinkedIn group, um, we talked about the catalog entries and the course descriptions. Um, I showed you that we have information about law school. I want to show you two more things. And the first is the definition of paralegal. Um, this is from the State Bar of Texas. And um, this is, you can see here these words that I've talked about so often, specifically delegated substantive legal work. That is what paralegals do very different from what a legal secretary would do, from what a legal receptionist or a file clerk would do. Those folks are really important in law firms, um, but they don't do the same type of work, the same category of work that paralegals do. 
paralegals for the most part do the type of work that attorneys do. They just do it with supervision. That's the big difference. Okay, so I wanted to show you this definition and now I want to take you to the BLS. The BLS stands for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It is a federal agency and you can find any job. Let's say that I'm thinking about becoming a plumber. So I have to spell it correctly. I can click on here and find out what plumbers do. You can see they give you pay information, what type of education they need. I can drill down and get more information. I can even get it regionally. And I can find related types of industries. Well, of course, we're not, I mean, you may be interested in becoming a plumber. It's a wonderful field, very important stuff. Uh, but let's just look, well, let me first of all look at attorney. We'll click on attorney. And here this gives you the, the average pay or median pay is 121,000. And it talks about the um, education that you need. And it shows that the job outlook for this a period of time for approximately the next 10 years, it's growing about average, about 6%. So it's very, very good. If this is what you want to do, then that's wonderful. And I fully applaud that. That's what I did. So I, I'm, I think that's a wonderful path. Let me, let's just show you what paralegals are like here. And you can see the pay is about 51 on average. In our market, it's more like 65, and you can see it's growing at a much faster rate than average. I think 12% might be the highest rate they have for any of these fields, so it's about as high as you can get. If we look here at the state and area data, you can click on and drill down and get more specific information, but the number is about 65%, excuse me, 65,000 is the average rate for paralegal. There are plenty of paralegals in the Dallas-Fort Worth area who earn six figures, low six figures, um, but six figures. For the most part, those individuals are going to be working downtown and they're going to be working a lot of hours. Um, if you work for a large downtown firm, there's lots of opportunities for overtime and that's how you make that kind of money. So um, if you are uh, focused on the highest paycheck, there definitely is a path for that. And I'm not going to say that there isn't a path in Collin County for that. Um, so uh, within obviously any number, 65,000, there's going to be lots of people earning a lot more and there are going to be people earning less. You're probably not going to earn $65,000 in your first job, especially if you don't have a bachelor's degree. Um, so it, that is obviously kind of the midpoint where, you, where you'll, you'll end up when you are well-established in your career. Um, if you want uh, more information about the data and, and information along those lines, um, there are other places to go. One place to look is ONET. ONET.org. Let's see if that's right. Might be, uh, that's not it, onet.com, might be .gov, <laughs> I'm not sure, nope, okay, we'll try onet.gov, <laughs> sorry about this, oh, no, what am I doing wrong here, onet, here, let me just put it into Google, ONET online, sorry about that. So this is a neat place to, if you are thinking, oh, maybe paralegalism isn't for me, I want to explore other uh, possibilities. Um, you can uh, go here and find lots of other things. You can obviously type paralegal here and find information about paralegal, about the types of things that they do, about the knowledge required, about things along those lines. If you're thinking, oh, maybe paralegalism isn't for me, or I want to check out other possibilities, that's just smart to do that. I highly recommend you do it. And you can see um, different professions that might have, you know, maybe uh, being a carpenter is a, a 
area that's growing. Um, so um, lots of different fields that you might want to look at were on this list. Um, uh, paralegalism is on the, the bright, bright Futures list. But anyway, uh, these are resources that, that make a lot of sense to look at. You may want to uh, look at, you know, if you're thinking about law school, uh, what those paths are like, what particular disciplines within the law are most likely to grow. And this can also give you some idea about the skills that you'll want to focus on to uh, progress in whatever careers you want to accomplish. So we're done with the orientation. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Please browse these documents that I've shown you and the websites that I've shown you so that you can have a, a deeper grasp a, as to this career path. One thing I like to say in this course is that I consider it successful when folks say, yes, this is what I want to do. And I also consider it equally successful when somebody says, oh my gosh, I am so glad I found out what this was about because this is not what I want to do. That's a success too. Um, the law is a tremendously compelling and interesting and satisfying endeavor for people who find it interesting and satisfying. It is a train wreck for people who don't like it. I'm going to end with a kind of a funny story. I had a friend, really smart guy, he's still a friend of mine, so I should say have a friend, who decided he wanted to go to law school. He had a high GPA in college and did really well in standardized tests. He got into the University of Texas Law School. He attended the University of Texas Law School for three weeks, maybe a month. He withdrew at that point. He knew at that moment, this is absolutely not for me. Unfortunately, he still got, I think, $20,000 worth of debt because of, you know, he had to prepay his tuition and things like that. He went on to having a great career in a related industry, so it's not a sad story, but wouldn't it have been wonderful if he had taken a paralegal course and for, you know, a few hundred or a thousand dollars been able to discover, oops, that's not for me. He could have saved himself a lot of time and, and mental anguish over that type of situation. So you've done something really smart by exploring this. If it's a good fit for you, awesome, wonderful, I'm so excited. I love the law. If it's not a good fit for you, I'm so excited for whatever path is the good fit for you. If I can provide any information about law school or anything else, please let me know. I'm glad to provide it. Thanks so much for your attention. Come see me if you've got questions. Have a wonderful day. Take care.